Before we, we get into it, though, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing at Optum, who you'd like to meet at Summit, what you'd like to learn from them, what they can learn from you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm this close to being death right now. This past weekend, I was in an all-star cheerleading competition uh, with 1,500 teams and about 30,000 screaming cheerleaders. So if I'm overly loud on the mic, it's because I haven't gotten my hearing back yet. <laughs> So, but Karen Thomas Smith from North Carolina, what I'd love to do is just connect with other really smart people, which I've already over lunch have learned some new things and look forward to taking back some best practices. We're notorious of hearing things at these type of events and then putting them to action really quickly and just having some fun. You know, as I shared with you backstage, the team when I got here immediately told me the party looked great, so we're looking forward <laughs> to that as well. We'll be there soon. Um, let's start, so let's start by looking at the results and, and why you won. So this all started with kind of a pilot campaign, right? Talk about that. Yes, so when I was hired to come to Optum about four years ago, it was to stand up a new division and launch a new market. And we wanted to try some things a little bit differently, so we did a pilot program um, that was very successful, leading with content and thought leadership. And we thought, you know what, let's try this to the broader provider market and see what kind of success we can see. Yeah, and pretty successful, that pilot program, $52 for every dollar invested, yes. what you see in the title. Give us an idea of some of the first few months results you had there. You know, we were real fortunate. Um, very quickly, we realized that our content and our information resonated. Uh, the rest of the company wasn't quite sure what we were doing because we were not really thinking about a campaign. We were thinking about what story do we need to tell in the marketplace. And you can see we had in less than um, 10 months about 6 million impressions. Um, we had 6,500 would go through the gated content landing page, uh, drove quite a bit of dollars in the pipeline, which that's what matters, is being able to talk about the deals that you closed and the revenue that you drove. So in quick order, we saw those results. Absolutely. Uh, all right, well, let's start by understanding Optum. So how does Optum serve a customer? Or where do you sit within yeah. Optum? Yeah, and most people don't know Optum. Um, I joke, we're the largest startup company. <laughs> We've got the information about 120,000 employees. We're now at 165,000 employees. And we service all of the healthcare ecosystem. And the area that I lead up marketing for is providers. And that means anybody that provides care in any way. So doctors, home health, any providers of health care. And then you look, we also serve employers, so Target's a big client of ours, um, any of the health plans, so United, the Blues, so all the segments of health care, and we provide technology and services. Okay, great. So as we said before, we're talking about some of these big results, you know, and it seems like a done deal, but there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into it, I'm sure. So let's back it up for a few years. 2012, you started with Optum. What did you do when you first landed there? I looked at the team and they were talented, but they were stuck in doing one and done marketing. So we took the time to take a step back and really look at what does it take with the maturity model of marketing to be successful. If you want to live up to two things, being a trusted educator to your market and being a trusted partner to your internal constituents. And we looked at the different areas of marketing, whether it be your knowledge, how you talk about your products, how you engage sales, and we graded ourselves on that continuum to figure out how close were we to those shared goals, to having champions, to understanding the marketplace, and realized we had a lot of work to do because, you know, like a lot of marketing departments that people didn't really understand strategic marketing. They thought we were PowerPoints and brochures and trade shows, and that was it. So we realized we really needed to move the needle on what we were delivering. And that's this marketing maturity model you talked about. You want to walk us through what some of the key elements of it are? Yeah, I mean, it is so important, as I said, when you look at what is your team doing from a marketing activity, that's where it was clear we were one and done. Then when you think about measurement, what were they measuring? And they weren't measuring things that drive to the bottom line that you could stand up to your CEO or someone else and say, here's the revenue we've helped generate and close. It was really more ad hoc reporting that didn't have a lot of value. Um, then looking at, do I know my customer and what is the industry knowledge? And what I found, and I think what really hurt was everybody was talking their product. You know, inwardly focused and you know, it reminded me, my mom gave me a great advice when I was young. When you go on a date, it's 
spend the whole night talking about them, and when they go home, they'll think you were the best date ever. They'll tell everybody, that was a great date. <laughs> and that's what we had to get away from. We were talking about ourselves all the time and not ever talking about our clients or our prospects. So what was one of the key things you thought you had to change? I think you, you got into content marketing. It seemed important. We did. We had to start talking about what mattered and educating the client. So when we talk about this case study, you'll find that in healthcare, it, there's a big transformation going on and there's no one kind of talking about what that transma transformation looks like and what you need to do to weather it. I mean, health systems will tell you that they're this step, this close from going out of business. And it was clear that each of our marketers and our sales team needed to have a deeper understanding of our customers, what they cared about, and what was going on in the industry. And that was something we needed to do in short order. Okay, so walk us through, you have this unique analogy for content marketing. Why content marketing? Yes. Make that case for us. So, you know, I shared with you when we've talked that don't underestimate the change curve for your team when you start to do something different. And so I, I related it to dating. And one and done marketing is like going on a date and at that first date um, asking someone to come home to your parents. And so we kind of use this image of one and done marketing, you're sitting alone, you're waiting for a date and no one's really taking you up on it, but you think you're the best date ever. You know, the next thing is you send them one and done marketing and you're like asking them to marry you, which is kind of our next imagery that we use to tell the story. Uh, think about how much that would freak you out. You met somebody in a bar and they immediately want to take you home to mother. I, I don't think you'd want to be engaged with them, right? You'd run the other way and say, no, no, don't want to do business with you. And then lastly, we talked about the fact that it is making, thinking everybody looks just like you. That all prospects think like you, do like you, talk like you, and those were the mistakes we were making. You know, with the one and done marketing, leading with our products, talking about ourselves, and we were scaring prospects away. Now, when a lot of leaders come into organizations, I'm sure we've all seen this, you know, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So yeah. if what they did before is database marketing, they come in and say database marketing yeah. is a solution, or say email marketing is a solution. But I was really surprised you did not have a lot of content marketing experience before. No, none at all. So you just came in fresh and said, and said content marketing. When I looked at what was going on in the industry and I looked at the story that we needed to tell and what was going on, we've got to do it differently. We've got to become a trusted educator to the marketplace to really navigate what's going on with this transformation in healthcare. Um, and that's really what started it all. But then I realized we had to flip the team around and we needed to do it differently. We couldn't do it as everybody had always marketed. Okay, this is a pretty complex case study, but let's walk it by step by step as best we can. So it starts with the team. You came in, you saw those changes were necessary. How did you align the organization around content? That's not easy. No, it's not. We literally flipped all the roles uh, on its side. We're a lot of marketing organizations will say, we've got this particular product, we need to get out to market, do a campaign. We said, nope, we don't even want to talk about campaigns. We want to first look at a list of all the content, all the topics we need to be talking about, then build a campaign as, a, as secondary, so flipping that model. And how we did that was really look at different roles. So when you think about the traditional roles, if you have you know, event managers, you've got marketing managers, those traditional roles, we flipped it to where we had sales liaison. So this is a person that's dedicated, it was actually Meg who was just up on the stage, to be that one point of contact with the field, living with them, understanding what's going on, hearing what prospects are saying, hearing why we're losing deals, and just living in their world constantly and bringing that back to us for closed learning. Then the other one was a dedicated thought leadership and content, and that is waking up all the time understanding what should we be talking about, what topics should we be putting out into the marketplace, and keep making sure that machine is fully going. Then we moved into segment marketers, which literally they are marketing and talking to a segment and a persona and not talking product at all. 
So rearranging kind of all of those marketing roles was the first thing we did. And it's different. There, I haven't really seen anybody organize this way, and it really confused the rest of Optum when we did it. <laughs> we got nicknamed Rogue very quickly. <laughs> I bet. So when you did this, I mean, this is, can be a pretty big transition. Any changes can be, yes. can be difficult. Moving from one way of thinking to another, were there holes you identified, or how did you shepherd people along to move to... We did. You know, as I mentioned, when you looked at that maturity, marketing maturity model, one of the things that was so important was to understand the market, so that industry knowledge. So we realized that there was a big gap in understanding our prospects, understanding what was going on in the industry. So we needed to come up with a way to educate all of our marketing teams, the sales team, and we went and hired somebody in a firm to actually interview all the different roles across our constituent space. So looking at large hospital systems, community hospitals, large IDNs, and it had nothing to do with Optum. When they reached out to Column, we didn't ask them questions about products or what they wanted to buy. Literally talked to them about their world, what was going on, how they like to consume data, how they like to receive information, and what mattered to them. And that was kind of the first turn around for us to get educated and understand our prospects and clients better. So we, as we see here, a little more of the team that you lined the town around, some we saw on stage before. But uh, so was part of that also a way of training the team to think differently? We did, yes. I mean, it, it was totally aligning what our goals were. And we'll talk about this in, in a little bit about kind of true north. Uh, and really aligning what mattered to the team and have the ability to say no. So when you understand that True North is you know, producing revenue and pipeline for the salespeople, you can say no to other things around you know, things that don't matter, things that aren't going to push everything forward. Um, so really helping them understand what was True North and also understanding the clients and the prospects that they were serving. And that's so important in managing a team because I'm, all marketers, as, as Austin was showing in, in the beginning of uh, the summit, they don't feel like they have enough budget. They don't feel like they have enough resources. They, they don't have time. So knowing what they can focus on and prioritize on has just have got to be huge with the team. Well, and also, you know, we talked about, um, like most marketing organizations, it seems like your budget gets cut quite a bit. And, you know, I tell them all the time, it doesn't matter if we have a dollar or we have $100. We're creative enough to figure out what to do with it and be successful. So we don't let the budget slow us down. Uh, we're pretty resourceful, as you can see from the picture. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so for any transformation, it starts with the people there. We talked about the team somewhat. Now let's talk about the customer, right? Yes. So this entire summit, it's about customer-first marketing. The customer first element was huge with the awards. Yes. We picked an award winner. And one thing we really like that you did is that's where you started the campaign. We you did. started with the customer. So how, yeah. did, how did you do that? Well, you know, as I shared, we, we took an outside firm and we interviewed. So these are all of our major buying personas. And we even broke them down to sub bullets. It's easy to say we're going to go after a CEO. But a CEO looks different at the different types of hospital systems and provider organizations. So just a real short 15 minute interview and I'll tell you guys a lesson learned. Whenever you're trying to get C-suite of any kind, you know, time and attention, don't ask for a 30 minute meeting. For whatever reason, you asked 15, you asked 20, they think they can have another meeting behind that and they'll accept it. So when we first tried to do these interviews, we were asking for 30 minutes, we got shut down all over the place. Once we changed it to 20 minutes, we started, people were picking up phone calls and, you know, having a dialogue and being interviewed. And what type of questions? It wasn't about Optum products, right? No, it? nothing about Optum. They didn't even know Optum was, was calling them. It literally was asking them things like, you know, what media do you like to learn from? You know, um, we ask about emails. Do you like videos? I mean, we were, we were asking about how they like to consume information and, in essence, how they like to receive information. Even down to, if somebody comes in to talk to you, what do you expect them to do? And what annoys you that they do? So really learning more behavioral things, not the traditional, you know, are you using analytics currently? If you are using analytics, you know, would you budget for this? It was none of those types of qualifying questions. It truly was behavioral questions. 
I think probably most executives are more free to answer that. You know, people want to know about them as opposed to what's your budget and exactly. when are you going to buy next? Right. And you know, that didn't matter because what we really were trying to determine is how should we be talking to them? What mattered to them? I mean, everybody can be what I call high S, again, all about self, all about their products. It's hard to really become high C and step back for a moment and not be enamored with your services and solutions. Because you know, we all think our stuff is pretty. But you know, do they and what matters to them? And that's why we did such a huge effort to take time to really drill into each one of these personas. OK, and so what did you, what did you learn about your customers? Quite a bit. And I was good. I remembered to bring it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we, it's funny, this morning session when they talked about you know, they learned from the email template that people like bullets and consuming information in these little nuggets. Nuggifying is what we did. We learned we needed to have little nuggets of information about each one of these personas and what they cared about. And you can see, you can see some of their, their goals, the key issues they're dealing with, tell me about me, what do I like to be given, steer clear of these types of things. So we learned a lot of information and it's amazing how it varies across these different segments. Yeah, so that's something, as a writer, I love good terms, and in working with Karen before this, if you're looking for something to tweet, I think Karen invented this, I haven't heard it before, nuggifying content. You want to reach executives, you got to get into nuggifying your content. It's the truth. <laughs> I love that. So also, what you're holding in your hand, though, not only did you learn this, but you really communicated this through the organization. How, how did you do that? We did, we did. We actually made them like this, these cards, so each member of the marketing team could have it but also at our global, global growth conference, which is just a fancy word for sales meeting, <laughs> um, we gave this to all of the sales team and the sales leaders uh, for them to have it. And they liked it enough that these are now a little antiquated. We've just kicked off doing this project a second time um, after two years, interviewing the executives again, and we're going a layer deeper. We're moving into the influencers. That's great. Now, in B2B organizations, sometimes sales and marketing can butt heads somewhat. But I'd imagine if you go to the sales group and you say, here, here's how your customers want to be sold to. That's going to make you pretty popular. No, they loved it. And that's why we are redoing it, because they asked for, they want more. They want to understand. I mean, I, I told you this section in here that says, you know, steer clear of uh, failure to, you know, tailor what you're sharing with me and saying the same thing that you're saying to everybody else. I just picked one item. But it really does tell you how they want to be spoken to, and really how they want to be sold to. OK, great. So as we talked about, Karen really flipped what she was doing in an organization and focused on content a lot. So when you're wanting to deliver that content, the first challenge is creating high quality content. A lot of marketers tell us they're challenged with that. How did you overcome that challenge? Well, I, you know, I think I shared with you one of my favorite kind of quotes is you know, from Mark Twain, if, you know, if I had, had more time, I'd write a shorter letter. <laughs> which is so true, it's hard to be concise. And the first thing we really had to deal with is how do we tell what we do to the marketplace in a way that matters to them? And I mentioned the transition that healthcare is going into. They're going from a payment structure which is fee for service to fee for value. So completely how they get paid is changing. And so another set of interviews that we did was to understand what does that look like for them? And we created what's called the journey from providing care to managing health. And really proud of this because we'll be at events like this and you'll have people come up and take a picture of this because they're like, I want to use this in my staff meeting. This is exactly my world. So we didn't put anything up there that was the name of our products. It was more kind of the life cycle and, and what they were going through through this journey. Um, so that helped us start the story of starting to build content out for that journey and what it looked like to go from providing care to managing health. So let's, let's back this up a bit because I think this is really important. I mean, you are essentially creating a business strategy for potential customers. Yes. How did you go about knowing what that strategy should be? How did you have that vision? Well, one is through all the interviews and spending time with, the, with our existing clients. Um, we created something that's called the SHARE program, which is a reference program. And it really does have dedicated folks that align to your best assets, which are your champions. 
Um, a lot of companies, when they have a client that will tell good things about them, we all do this. We burn the daylights out of them until they yell, uncle, leave me alone. I don't want to do another success story. I'm not going to do a video. Um, and we don't take care of those people. We ask for a lot of work from them, but we don't help them. So we have a dedicated team that wakes up every morning and every day, and how do I take care of our reference clients? It's a formalized program. And they've got one point of person that comes to them and asks for anything, whether it's a reference visit, whether it's a case study, whether it's a video. And what you'll find is they'll do 40% more on average by having that dedicated person looking out for them. So the amount of learning that we have from all of these clients, we're just closed looping that every day back into what we're telling and what matters to them. And that's really how we built that. We even tested that messaging out on all of our clients. Does this make sense? Where are we off mark? Is this your world? Um, and that's why I think we were so successful with it. Walk us through how that share program works, because that's, that's really interesting. Is this a set of meetings they have? Is there some sort of incentive for them? Why do they get involved? There, there is. So there's several uh, best practices and, and benefits that they get from it. One is, again, in healthcare, they're having to become more marketers themselves. You'll see it when you drive down the street. Best heart center, you know, best you know, children's pediatrics. So anything that can help build their brand, because that really is what they need to do to stay in business. So one of the things that we help do is, you know, submit them for speaking, writing up case studies, producing videos. You don't have a very big budget in a hospital. So when we produce one of these videos, we do it in a way that they can actually make it an asset and use it at their own hospital. Um, so we, they get a lot of benefits that way. We also provide credits for them. So if they actually will do a phone call, it's like a credit to you know, come to our user conference or things like that. So there are incentives involved. But like I said, just having somebody that you don't have t you know, 250 salespeople or 250 marketing people hit them up, just one person that understands when they want to do things and when they don't, it, just, it goes a long way. And so we're constantly around them and learning from them. Do you get them together to network in any way? Is that part we, of the benefit? At part of our big client event, they have an opportunity to do that. We have different type of user events that they can all be a part of that they network. And as a matter of fact, some of these videos talk about the power of learning from each other. And of course, we're listening and taking notes when they're learning from each other. That's great. I'm sure that's a big benefit for them, too, so they can learn how they to do. make this transition yeah. together. OK, so we saw that, that big transition. Right, that, that overarching strategy that guided what you do. So now let's get into how you're actually creating some of this content. So you were selected for Best in Show based on this Game Changer campaign. Walk us through, how did you take that? So you had an overall business strategy, right? right? So how did you take that business strategy and then turn it into content that was compelling? So when we were you know, talking to the prospects and understanding what was going on in their world, we realized, and what this campaign was positioning at, at the end of the day was analytic solutions for healthcare. And they had never really used analytics. It was something new to them, and it was something overwhelming. So what we figured out is, one, we needed to talk about analytics almost like for dummies, and not talk about it in this heady, let's do a white paper and let's get very kind of, it's this statistic and this predictive models. There's, there's data geeks that get that, but the people that really drive the decisions, that connection doesn't exist. So the very first piece that we built, which we call primary content, was the Game Changer ebook. And just made analytics just, just an interesting story about how it changes the game when you have it in place. And never really listed any type of solutions. And it's funny, it does kind of aggravate our salespeople sometimes. They'll call me and say, our product name isn't in there. And I'm like, that's intentional. That's we don't point, want to right? talk about product. <laughs> but they get upset about it. But I'm like, just watch what it does. Watch what this thought leadership will do for you. You know, that's really key how you really reimagine this. Because I think of what a lot of brands are facing, and tell me if the healthcare industry is this way, Content marketing has grown in popularity, yeah. right? 
And so part of the challenge, as more companies are doing it, it gets harder and harder. Mm -hmm. It gets dark, harder to stick out. It gets harder to get heard. So maybe to give the audience an idea of how they can reimagine what they're doing, if the rest of your industry is doing white papers and all these other things, how did you get that initial idea? Was there anything that, that inspired it? Or? it? It did. Just, you know, again, meeting with prospects going, yeah, we're not going to do anything because this is so overwhelming. You know, everybody's talking to us about analytics. We don't know what the right thing is to do. We don't, you know, it all just, you know, it looks all the same. Um, so that led to us of really making it simplified versus just going with the hype of using the big terms of, you know, you can get predictive models and you can do this. We just made it in layman's terms. And like I said, went with this ebook and made it around the game changer and the Moneyball movie and just made it relatable versus it seeming like something that they couldn't do because it was beyond what healthcare had seen. Now, that seems counterintuitive in a way because when we see a lot of, especially technical marketing, yes. they like to use a jargon. It shows off that they know what they're doing. Did you get any pushback? Because I love that? my products. Oh, yes, yes. They love their products. We're going to talk about our baby and how pretty it is and all the feature functions that you have. It's counterintuitive to not talk about feature functions when you're a technology company. Speeds and feeds. Yeah. Um, okay, so the ebook was part of it, but give us an idea. What was this ecosystem of this campaign around this ebook? Well, you know, we are really good because nuggifying is important uh, of reimagining content. So we will build a primary piece of content and we will reimagine it into 25, 26 different pieces of content and different strategies because not everybody likes to consume content the same way. So we do infographics and blogs and videos and white papers and ebooks and we'll reimagine it into many different ways. So there's something for everyone really at the end of the day. And you have to reimagine it if you've got a small team. You know, we've got a team of seven people and we're able to build over a thousand pieces of content in the 10 months that we first kicked off the Game Changer campaign. And it is the reimagining. And we've got little packets. Whenever we create a primary piece of content, we know that we're going to build this many blogs, this many tweets, this many banner pages. It's just automatic. And we've got it down to just kind of a machine now. So I just want to make sure everyone got that, because that was really key what Karen said. You know, we hear a lot, it's hard to produce content. How do you keep up? How do you produce content? A thousand pieces of content from one core idea, from one core yeah. piece. That's really huge. And how long do you think this will last? When is it time to launch that next campaign and to freshen up again? Yeah, you know, I've, a wise person once said, when you start to get bored and you think the concept is old, is right when it's sticking in the market. Mm. So don't stop because you are bored with it, but it's just catching on. So we, we believe that we probably have through 2016 sticking with the integrated campaign around Game Changer, because the results keep going up every week. Oh, that's great. So it's not just a big splash. It's, it's starting to get out there, maybe get viral within that organization. No, yes, that without a doubt. We've actually had several schools ask us to use the money book, the ebook, as part of training their healthcare administrators. So we're now in our fifth school asking to use it and repurpose it. Wow. I've never heard that with a white paper, I've got to say. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's get into to how you actually uh, create that content machine. So we talked about some of the roles before. Let's talk about how this relates to the actual content that's being created. Walk us through this graphic, if you would. Yeah, so once you turn on the spigot and you are a trusted educator in the marketplace, the last thing you can possibly do is run out of content. Um, so first best practice is find somebody like Leslie that you saw on stage. Perfect example, last week on our one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to run out of content, Karen, we're going to run out of content. <laughs> I'm like, Leslie, we've got this much content, doesn't matter, we've got to have more. Um, so you need somebody like that. You also need somebody like Alina, who's with us as well, of figuring out that lead integrated campaign machine. We talk about, we want to make sure everybody gets in a cul-de-sac and never goes out. So just constantly feeding them content in whatever distribution channel they want to consume it and really being able to read what matters to them and send them down different cul-de-sacs. So we have truly have made it a machine. We have a constant list of content topics that we need to be building out. And we start with that. We don't ever start with 
we need a blog, or we need to build a white paper. We keep this running tally of the top content topics that we need to be thinking about, and we revisit it and we move it all the time. Um, and then we determine, okay, if this is the content, how do we want to display it and what makes sense? Should it be an infographic or another ebook? And then we feed it into the lead nurture machine and have it feed the different spokes around the different types of solution areas. So start with what the customer needs to right. learn. Yeah, and in, in the way you reimagined your team too, are they able to go deeper into specific yes. areas? Yes. You want to tell us about that? Yes, so we have uh, segment marketers that are around what we call clinical transformation. And clinical transformation really is this, the game changer campaign, is being able to leverage you know, analytics, being able to leverage uh, patient engagement to really change healthcare from a clinical perspective. So um, Leslie focuses just on that clinical transformation, talking to the CMO, talking to um, all the clinicians. And then I have a, another group that really looks at IT transformation. It may shock you guys, but healthcare is not that advanced with IT. I'm sure you've all seen that. Um, really, what does that look like and that journey look like? And then we've got an administrative persona, which is really talking about that whole journey slide that you saw. Um, so they're, they're all thinking about a persona and a segment um, that eventually leads to a product, but the product isn't the first thing that they're thinking about. That's great. As we talked about earlier, we're all so busy, right? But getting to say no to things and getting to actually focus, mm -hmm. I think must really help create better content. Too. It does. I mean, it was a hard sell. When you've got a business unit and their revenue target is around this widget, they want to see that widget being talked about. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, so it took internal selling and training for them to get the value of what we were doing as well. Yeah, well, let's talk about sales some. So at the end of the day, you're a B2B organization. Marketing can't do it alone. So let's get into how do you work with sales? Well, you know, I mentioned True North. And when I joined the team, um, I realized that it was the BU that was driving a lot of what they were doing. And it was, let's get this, you know, PowerPoint brochure or this trade show because it was about talking about their widget. And very quickly, you know, I, the team needed to pivot and focus on sales. A uh, great friend of mine that's one of the sales leaders at Optum said, the best companies you can't see where marketing ends and sales begins. And I think that happens when you've got shared goals. So the MBOs or the team are very simple. There's two. It's lead generation. So a percentage, 20% of what the sales goal is, is our goal. And we have to put leads into that pipeline that the sales team didn't know about. And then the other one is sales acceleration, and that is speeding up the pipeline to go to closure, so helping deals close faster. So the team is very laser focused. Meg is the sales liaison in all of them. They know exactly what leads, where they've gone, and when it closes, they're incredibly proud of it. And what's even more impactful are the notes that we get back from the sales team saying, couldn't have done this without you. This deal is because of these types of actions. So because our goals are aligned with them, we're not doing this. I mean, they see us as partners and, and really determining how are you going to be successful in your patch of dirt. And even though, let's point out, even though you're not putting the products on the content. We're not. We're not. I mean, it, it took, you know, probably eight months for them to stop asking for that. Uh, <laughs> so if you're month seven, just wait yeah, a little bit. Just in. keep going. Um, and they, they get it now. And they actually, and you know how you know they get it is they start to be a little bit like Leslie. I need another ebook. Or you got to have another video for me. They're starting to lead with that. And in their email signatures, they're linking their prospects to our content. And let's walk through um, how that content helps to it, lead nurturing. So one of the things you said to me early on that was great is you said, I don't care if you get a name at a trade show that's not a lead. No. So what is a lead and how do you get there? Yeah, we call that bad lead fatigue is when you have a trade show and you go, this is a hot lead. And then you hand it over to salespeople and they're like, yeah, I think you're doing drugs. That is, <laughs> that is nothing. Um, so that's the other hard thing that you'll get a fight from salespeople. They say they don't want these leads. But then in the next breath, they'll say, send me everything from the webinar. So becoming and telling sales no as well, that it's not ready for you to have a conversation, that's a hard thing for them to get to know and understand as well. So we do talk about, by the time you get this lead, 
there has been this introduction phase. And during that introduction phase, we don't gate anything. Uh, we are giving content that you can consume without having to give us an email, without having to, you know, give us your title. And Aline has done a wonderful job of, of helping us do a lot of testing to determine how much can we ask for. So we're just getting little breadcrumbs from them, but we're giving them something in exchange. We're giving them valuable content. So each time we get a little bit more from them, and eventually we'll have all the profile we need from them, and that's the educational, I mean the introduction phase. The deeper they go, they're getting more rich content. So an ebook may mean we need to get an email from you, but they're already engaged in an integrated campaign and they're kind of picking the path and the type of content that they want to consume. We're always asking them what they want to consume. From that in the engagement phase, we see them go deeper in the qualification and at that point our lead generations team will call them and nurture them more. So by the time we're handing it over to sales, there's been multiple conversations going on with this prospect. There's been learning, but then again, it's not learning of, do you have a budget? Those questions aren't asked. It's more, would you like to learn more? Okay, and, and that's how you define a lead, right? It's when, when sales actually says, oh yes, this is a lead, this is someone I can talk to. Yeah, no, they, yeah, they have to turn it into a sales opportunity. Just, you know, the term marketing qualified lead isn't enough. It needs to be converted in their pipeline. Okay, when well, you talked about learning a little more as you go about them. So you're talking about progressive profiling and each form has another piece and so you're just kind of yep. getting a little bit as you go. Yeah, and so also, um, so to build up to this point where it's a sales qualified lead, I would assume all of that content you created that we talked about, that really helps nurture them and grow this relationship uh, over time. Oh, it, it stays in front of them. That's why I said the comment of once you start it, you can't stop because they, ex they expect to continue to get content. I mean, we've all seen the studies. They do 70% of their research before they ever reach out to have a conversation with a salesperson. Um, so we, we've got, that's why it's so important to have so much content because you can't let it get stale. You have to keep pushing little nuggets in front of them until they feel like one, they can trust you, or two, you've said something meaningful that they wanna have a deeper dialogue. Yeah, so we saw some case studies up here earlier, if you were in the email and mobile track, about B2C companies that were looking to engage the audience until it was the right time to buy, and especially for a B2B company. I mean, really understanding what is that path to purchase, not an instant path to purchase, right? It takes time, not the instant they meet you at the trade show. And how can you feed them with content and helpful information until they get ready to talk to someone in sales? Right, and it's got to be the content they want to consume, and I think that's the hard, that's the, there's no silver, silver bullet to know perfectly what that content is. I mean, we've made a lot of mistakes. Mistakes. And you've got to be free to try things and go, oh yeah, that was ugly, and then try another take. And, and we're not afraid to make mistakes and stumble. Um, and I, I think that's another reason why we've been successful. We're, you know, we have the ability and the freedom to do really stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's experimentation. We're all experimenting as we learn about our customers. Yes. So let's take a look at the numbers now. We saw some preliminary figures earlier. Mm -hmm. Where are you today? Yeah, and even these numbers have changed since we've put all this up here because it's, it's constantly moving da daily. But this integrated campaign has generated over 12 million impressions. Um, wow. I think the biggest thing to say, you know, way to go team, is the 250% of gold, which that was a stretch goal. Uh, we shouldn't have blown it out that much, but we have. Um, so, sorry guys, it's going up this year, as you know. Uh, <laughs> and then over $120 million in sales pipeline, and that number now is about $160 million. Very nice, very nice, very impressive. Uh, so let's end with some key takeaways for the audience. Out of all this that you've gone, this has been about a four-year journey. What are the top takeaways you'd give to other marketers? You know, it's what I said early on. Everybody needs to be high C, and that's, that's hard. The business will push you to be high S. Um, they struggle with understanding being a thought leader. Uh, B Rogue, when we started it, it was a nickname that we got at Optum. We were being different and not everybody appreciated that. Uh, but the results spoke for themselves because every segment now is doing what we're doing. Um, Elaine is a business partner. She always makes us feel good. She says none of them are quite as, as a, you know, advanced as we are. I, I think she's just trying to be nice to us. Um, but, you know, be rogue and wear it proudly. And then lastly, you've got to have true north. We, there's so much noise out there. 
Keep it simple for your team and really truly give them the ability to say no. I think marketers by nature, we want to please and we have a hard time saying no. And you know, you've got to push back. You've got to push back to sales and the business and that's not always easy. Yeah, and, and focus on those priorities, be able to say no, yeah. Uh, so again, thank you, Karen, so much. Thank you for coming out here with your team. Thank you for, for sharing everything uh, with yeah. us. And uh, another big round of applause for Karen and her award-winning team. Thank you.